The following presentation has been posted to the discussion board as a YouTube video adapted from a PowerPoint presentation. Many points are presented on the slides while full explanations and citations are written in the notes section of the original PowerPoint. These can be accessed to read instead of watching the video by clicking on the link to the PowerPoint provided in the discussion board. References are given at the end of this presentation as well as in a separate Word document that can be accessed as well. Enjoy our presentation about epilepsy. In this presentation, we want people to have a better understanding of what epilepsy is and how serious it can impact someone's life. Epilepsy can change someone's life instantly whether that is just having a small seizure or having brain damage that has resulted from having a major seizure. Listening to this presentation will hopefully give you an insight of how the brain and body are affected when having a seizure. The brain is one of the first parts of the body that people think about that are affected from having a seizure, but the whole, body, whole entire body is also affected. The brain has many functions and a major function is to send signals to the body to help perform a task. Simple tasks such as just standing up and balancing your body can be affected. Massive seizures can also affect the body even more and someone possibly may have to have others do simple tasks for them because they simply cannot. There are also examples provided later in the presentation on how to help reduce the risk of a head injury. Also being mindful of ways to avoid an episode from occurring will help reduce the number of seizures that someone has. This slideshow is to help educate people about the signs and symptoms of a loved one who suffers from epilepsy. Parents of children who are under the age of 18 need to be aware of what a seizure looks like, especially in younger children. It also is important for older adults to be aware. If someone is having an episode, their spouse or significant other needs to be conscious of what a seizure looks like if they have never experienced someone else having one before. Middle-aged adults need to be familiar with their parents' condition in case if they were to have an episode when they are with them. Seizures can happen at any point of the day. It is much easier to witness, witness that someone is having a seizure during the day while they are awake and around people, but it is difficult to watch someone during the night when everyone is asleep. To prevent someone from hurting themselves while asleep, if they happen to have a seizure, is to remove sharp objects away from the bed, make sure that there are not very many pillows on the bed to avoid that person from suffocating, avoid sleeping on their stomach, and to share a bedroom with someone so they can help stop the seizure from progressing if one, to, if one were to occur. Depending on how often someone has a seizure, it is extremely important to take every sign and symptom serious. There are multiple diseases and conditions that have similar signs and symptoms, so treating everyone's symptom like a seizure could save their life. Although this is a rare condition, it is crucial that everyone is aware of how to help. Epilepsy can also be called seizure disorder. This happens because the brain distributes excessive electrical charges from brain cells, causing the brain's neurons to transmit disrupted electrical impulses. Very few people in America suffer from epilepsy. It is a very rare condition that can affect anyone from stages of being an infant to being an elder. About 1.2% of Americans suffer from epilepsy. To be more specific, 3 million adults are diagnosed with this condition and 470,000 children also suffer from this condition. The latest data shows that about 0.6% of children ages 0 to 17 suffer from epilepsy. There are several Americans that can have seizures, but not very many that are diagnosed with this condition. If you look at the picture that I have provided above, it shows the exact data that I was just discussing. Although data changes almost every day, as I said before, it was the latest data and this dates back to the year of 2015. 
As stated before, epilepsy is a chronic condition affecting the central nervous system in which brain activity becomes abnormal, causing seizures or periods of unusual behavior, sensations, and loss of awareness. Epilepsy has had many causes, but the seizure it causes usually are normally unprovoked, which means that the causes are out of the person's control. A seizure provided by a reversible trigger, such as fever or hyperglycemia, does not fall under the definition of epilepsy because it is a short-lived condition and not a chronic state. The brain has billions of neurons that are all connected to each another. They send electric signals back and forth to each other to control the entire body's functions. During an epileptic seizure, these electric signals get mixed up, and as a result, either that part of the brain or the whole brain cannot work properly. As a result, a person can lose their cognitive and motor functions without even realizing it. On average, a seizure can last anywhere from 30 seconds up to two minutes. Afterwards, most people do not remember what has happened during the seizure, and because no brain damage typically occurs during one, many resume their lives as if nothing has happened. Minor epileptic seizures are defined by a person typically zoning out during the period, while major seizures are defined by more loss of motor control and unconsciousness. Major seizures typically are a result of more brain misfunctioning and can last longer than minor ones. As for the frequency of attacks, they vary from person to person, with someone having one every couple of weeks to someone only having one every couple of weeks or months. There are many different types of seizures. Um, primarily, there are kind of two subsets and then um, to many different ones that follow, follow that. Um, and these two types are focal seizures and generalized seizures. Um, focal seizures involve just one area of your brain and are the most common type of seizures experienced by people with epilepsy. They're divided into two categories. Um, these include focal aware seizures. People with these types um, are aware of what's going on but may not be able to fully respond to people asking if they need help. This type of seizure only affects one side of the brain, meaning that any motor disruption only happens on one side of the body. And that kind of surrounds like, you know, one side of your brain controls one part of your body and the other part of your brain controls the other. Um, the next type um, is a focal impaired awareness seizure. People can be aware during aware or unaware that they're having a seizure. Um, it's sometimes preceded by what's called an aura, which is kind of like a warning sign someone gets when they, you know, they sense that a seizure is about to occur. Um, during this type of seizure, a person may have a blank stare and you know repeat the same action over and over again so kind of like chewing on the side of your mouth or on your tongue um rubbing your their fingers together really really like you know constantly um they could also simply you know freeze in their spot and so those are the two types of focal seizures um the other type are what's known as generalized seizures um, and these are um, characterized by a sudden onset of abnormal um, electricity on both sides of the brain. And so really instead of like one centralized part of the brain, it's really just kind of the entire brain. And this makes up um, six different types. And these include absence seizures. And this is where a person spaces out and loses complete awareness. Um, it's kind of just like you, you know, you zone out and you, you're like, you come back and you're like, whoa, what happened? Um, this is very common in children and it tends to last about like 20 to 30 seconds. Um, the next type 
is called a tonic seizure. And then um, this is where um, somebody's muscles, you know, suddenly stiffen. It's kind of like you freeze, like you're really, really stiff. And um, with this, um, you also tend to lose consciousness. Um, and so if you've ever kind of like heard of like somebody was, you know, somebody has a seizure and they fall over, um, this is what it is. They tend to have a tonic seizure. The next type of seizure is an atonic seizure. And instead of going stiff, your muscles completely relax and goes limp. Um, and you also tend to lose consciousness with this one. The next one is called a myoclonic seizure. And this is basically like when a person's muscles like really like jerk really fast. And so if you have ever like been sleeping and or like trying to fall asleep and suddenly you get that sensation where you're falling, um, you kind of like and you suddenly like burst back to reality and you kind of catch yourself. That's kind of what it's like, but um, just remember that um, epilepsy, you know, you didn't have a seizure. Epilepsy is when you have, you know, constant seizures. Um, this, you know, if when you, you know, jump in bed, it's more of a um, sort of reflex. Um, and then the last one is a um, is it sort of a mixture of the tonic and the um, myoclonic ones, and um, with that, um, you it's basically like a mix. So at the beginning of the seizure, um, you freeze completely and your muscles go really really stiff, and then you lose consciousness as a result, and then you you fall on the ground and then you start to, your muscles start to have sudden jerks and the person, you know, starts to start shaking. And so um, if, I think everybody kind of has this idea in their mind what a seizure looks like. Um, that's the, you know, this type of seizure is, you know, the one that most common people tend to think of. Some of the common signs and symptoms of a seizure, um, you know, I think a lot of people know some of the major ones, such as, you know, uncontrollable jerking movements and, you know, somebody falling to the ground. Um, but I think a lot of people don't realize that, like, seizures, you know, it's, it's not just sort of these big movements and, you know, actions. You know, you can literally, somebody could literally sit there and, freeze for, you know, 15 to 10 seconds and they've had a seizure. Their brain has short circuited. And so I think, you know, if you're doing research on epilepsy, you know, you know, knowing these signs are very important. And so, um, you know, some other signs is confusion. Um, you know, somebody just kind of stares off into silence. Um, if you're feeling really, really um, strange sensations, um, you know, it's, it's just feeling weird and it's, it's kind of like feeling like your brain is short circuited. There can be many triggers that can cause someone with epilepsy to experience a seizure. The most well-known trigger that can cause a seizure are flashing lights. An example of flashing lights causing a seizure is during the new Incredibles 2 movie. This trigger is most common in children and adolescents, which could be extremely dangerous since movies like Incredibles 2 cater to children. Although flashing lights might be a very well-known trigger, it only makes up about 3% of people who are diagnosed with epilepsy. The number one trigger of epileptic seizures is missed medication. People with controlled seizures have more unexpected seizures if they miss a dose of their medication. Missing medication can cause your seizures to occur more often and can then lead to long seizures called status epilepticus, which can be life-threatening if the seizures are not stopped. It is also important for people diagnosed with epilepsy to get plenty of sleep. Epilepsy and sleep work in a vicious cycle. 
While sleeping, there are changes in your brain's hormonal and electrical activity, which can lead to someone having a seizure while they are sleeping. If you don't get enough sleep, it can aggravate your seizures. This is why sleep and epilepsy are a vicious cycle, because not getting enough sleep can cause seizures, or getting sleep can cause seizures. Another example of a trigger is stress. Stress can take a toll on someone's body, which can cause headaches, sleeplessness, and anxiety. No one knows why stress can trigger seizures because it varies from person to person. One study found that some people feel a loss of control when they are stressed, which leads to developing anxiety. This can cause someone to hyperventilate, which can increase abnormal brain activity and provoke seizures. Alcohol is another potential trigger that can cause epileptic seizures, which is why limiting your alcohol intake could be an example of primary prevention. So when you're looking at the demographics of epilepsy, um, you kind of have to understand that epilepsy is actually the fourth most common neurological condition and it affects more than 65 million people worldwide. You know, of course, the U.S. only sees 3.5 million, but um, it's, it's very prevalent. Um, it can develop at any age, but um, it is most commonly seen being diagnosed in young, young children and older adults. Um, and actually, approximately 75% of all newly diagnosed cases of epilepsy occur during, during childhood. This happens as a result of children's brains just being, you know, they're kind of in a constant state of development. And, you know, therefore, they're more likely to have you know, sort of malfunctions, you know, it's it's kind of like their brain's constantly trying to develop that it, they just kind of, there's problems that occur. Um, after about one year of age, though, the rate actually kind of goes down of, you know, children developing epilepsy until about age 10. And, you know, after that, the rate kind of stays the same through adolescence and young adulthood. Um, and that goes until about the age of 55, where it kind of begins to climb. And this is kind of a, as a result of, you know, older adults, their brains begin to deteriorate. Um, they're more likely to develop brain tumors, Alzheimer's, and many other conditions that, you know, are associated with epilepsy. Um, and then something else that I had also pointed out that I also found pretty interesting is, um, with ethnicity and um you know they've you know they've always done you know studies to see um you know if one ethnicity is more prevalent to get this disease than the others um and while there have only been a few studies um some suggest that hispanics blacks and asian americans are more likely to be diagnosed than white americans with epilepsy um, scientists don't really know why this is, but one common suggestion is that these three groups of ethnicities in the U.S. tend to fall in a lower socioeconomic status than the white American. There are three types of prevention used to help combat a disease like epilepsy. The first type is primary prevention. Primary prevention is used to intervene before health effects or disorders can occur. This is done by reducing or eliminating underlying causes and risk factors. Head injuries are responsible for some cases of epilepsy, so you can reduce the risk of a head injury by wearing your seatbelt or by wearing a helmet. Strokes and other vascular diseases can lead to a brain injury, which can then lead to epilepsy. So, you can prevent this by limiting your alcohol and tobacco intake. The second type of prevention is secondary prevention. Secondary prevention is when you try to detect the disease early and prevent it from getting worse. An example of this is getting an EEG. An EEG is an electrocephalogram test used to diagnose epilepsy. 
During this test, electrodes will be attached to your scalp so they can record the electrical activity of your brain. If you have epilepsy, it will be common to show up on the test that your normal patterns of brain waves will change. Another test to detect epilepsy early is getting a CT scan. A CT scan will use x-rays to acquire images of your brain. These images will show any abnormalities that might be causes of epileptic seizures. Finally, the last type of prevention is tertiary prevention. Tertiary prevention helps to try to prevent a disease from limiting someone's life indefinitely or from getting worse. Tertiary prevention can be done by going through rehabilitation, therapy, surgery, or diets. Medications are one of the primary ways to control epileptic seizures. Medications like anticonvulsants can help control or prevent seizures and can relieve some pain. Another type of medication that can be used for epilepsy are nerve pain medications. If the medications fail to control epileptic seizures, then surgery might be a better option. During an epilepsy surgery, a surgeon will remove an area of your brain that is causing your seizures. With this surgery will come risks like having permanent cognitive disabilities. Another example of tertiary prevention is the ketogenic diet. My best friend Allison was just diagnosed with epilepsy a little over a month ago. She has a family history of having seizures and is not the only one in her family that is diagnosed with this condition. She had had a seizure back during high school around our junior year and then another one our senior year. She called me one day this past October on my way home from school to tell me about what had happened to her. She described to me about how she was sitting at home listening to her lecture over Zoom while eating dinner. She suddenly woke up and her face was laying on her desk in a puddle of drool. Her plate of food was basically thrown across the room and her laptop was on the ground. She was not aware what had just happened and assumed that she just passed out. When she told her mom all of this, her mom thought it was the best idea to go see a doctor to rule out the possibility of it being epilepsy. Her doctor then proceeded to confirm that she did have a seizure and is now on medication to help prevent this from happening again. Whenever I'm around Allie, I am now always prepared in case of something happens to her and her parents have educated all of her friends to make sure that we can stop the seizure properly without any complications. There are many myths and stigmas associated with epilepsy. Given the sometimes violent muscle contractions people go through, the disorder is often thought to be a mental disorder, and some religions tend to think that it's caused by evil spirits or other negative reasons. Because of this stigma, some people tend to believe that society will not accept them because of their disorder, and as a result, their mental health suffers. You know, I think it's it's very important that people with this disorder have an adequate support group because, you know, they're already suffering from, you know, fearing for their next seizure, fearing that this will never end, you know, just fearing for their health that I think with these um, society stigmas, you know, this can make this disease like 10 times worse. And so I think as a society, we need to work on breaking these stigmas. The number, the number one, one thing, thing that, that someone, someone with epilepsy needs is a proper support system. He or she needs someone that understands their condition and knows what to do when he or she is having an attack. If you are a parent with a child with epilepsy, make sure that they understand what is going on. Establish routines. Keep up on medications and just overall be positive. Living a normal life with epilepsy is a 100% possible, with most people living their everyday lives without having to worry about their next attack. Treatment and prevention is vital and should be available to anybody who needs it because they are like anyone else and they have the right to be a part of their society.